your fitness business podcast snapshot. What is mindful leadership? How does mindful leadership fit within the affinity principle? And what are the 12 pillars of mindful leadership? All of that and more coming up in today's episode. You're listening to the fitness industry's leading fitness business podcast for owners and managers, where each week we invite business experts, coaches, authors, and owners from all around the world to share their expert advice with you, the FBP family. This month's interviews are brought to you by Active Management. Welcome back, FBP listeners, and if this is your first time tuning in to the Fitness Business Podcast, I welcome you into our family. I am your host, Dori Nugent, and you are listening to episode number 312, your new leadership model with Grant Gamble. Grant is a best-selling mindful leadership author of The Affinity Principle. He's also a business strategist and a speaker who has worked with hundreds of companies across the globe ranging from Amazon to startups. But one fun fact about our guest that you probably don't know is that he's also very handy and he built his family home with his own two hands. Now you talk about a jack of all trades. (laughs) But before we get started, here's a quick message from our sponsor, Active Management. Hi, FBP family. It's JT from Active Management, the founding partner of the Fitness Business Podcast. Thanks to the amazing technology at our fingertips, we can now work with clients all over the world. But right now, you can join the free online Active Management Facebook community. It's an amazing group of people just like you. Sure, I share weekly resources, but it's the power of the community that you will experience that will make this your go-to Facebook group. Remember, it's free, fun, and inspirational. Go to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash active management community. Fitness Business Podcast family, I present to you Grant Gamble. Grant Gamble, welcome to the Fitness Business Podcast. It is so great to have you on the show today. Thanks, Dory. It's good to be here. Yes. And you are coming from Charlottesville, did you say? Yes. I'm based in Charlottesville, Virginia, on the east coast of the U.S., yes. Okay, now that's not an east coast accent that I'm hearing. (laughs) No. Um, Originally from Australia, uh, worked in the fitness industry over there, predominantly in consulting role, uh, and I came to the east coast in 97, and I've been here predominantly since then, so it's been like a 23-year stint now, I guess. Okay. So yeah, we can call you an East Coaster. I think you've got 23 years in. (laughs) So today we're going to talk about a leadership topic. Primarily, you've written a book called The Affinity Principle. It's about mindful leadership. So I was hoping that maybe you could just start off by explaining to our listeners exactly what you define as mindful leadership. So I see mindful leadership as when a leader or a manager, someone that has a team that they work with, is their ability to connect, resonate, empathize, and inspire that team. So when a leader is truly mindful and present, uh, the connection that they create with their team creates a really powerful momentum. And the affinity principle is about, you know, how to create that. Grant, I looked up the definition of affinity and I saw it's a natural liking for or an attraction to a person, thing, or idea. So I'm going to assume you're taking that definition and diving in a little bit deeper into what that means when it comes to leadership. Yeah, absolutely. Leadership isn't a popularity competition, so I'm not you know, suggesting that. What I'm suggesting here is that when there's an alignment between leader and team, between team and leader, uh, that affinity, when you can create that, creates an amazing synchronicity and, and momentum, as I described before. So the affinity principle is really how do you create that connection with your team and inspire them, but also resonate with them, connect with them. So the affinity uh, piece, by definition, it's, it's a great term for what I'm describing within the book. Yeah. 
and you worked a lot with the ACAC clubs. So from your experience in, in, the, in clubs, can you give us some practical examples of when this could or should occur? So the times when I've seen affinity make the most difference is times of stress, like times when you know, you're under pressure, things aren't going well, times like now (laughs) you know i mean i think there's not a person i'm working with uh that's not under a lot of pressure right now given the the strange times we're living in with covid and and such so when you can create affinity with your team in those times that synergy is actually buoys everybody up and that trickles down to the members which ends up impacting the bottom line in a positive way you know, it's really formulaic what I've, you know, described in the book. It's great leadership leads to a great team experience, which leads to a great member experience, which equals great financial results. So my focus is manage, you know, on the people end of the equation and the money will come. And I've proven that in many, many cases from, you know, single site clubs that I've owned myself all the way up to very large chains that, you know, are spanned across it in ACAC's case, the whole Atlantic coast. Grant, in your book, you talk about the an appraisal that we can use. So what can we do to identify our strengths and weaknesses in mindful leadership? I, like I said, there's an appraisal that we can use. Can you explain that? Yeah. So one of the things I did, I used two uh, studies or two sets of studies for the book. And one was the Gallup study on engagement. And the second one was the Globe 2020 CEO report. And in the Globe 2020 CEO report, uh, they created a frame of reference for leaders. And what they did, they looked across all the attributes a leadership would, leader would have, a mindful leader or an inspiring leader, a leader that people want to follow. And uh, what I've used is the questions from the Globe 2020 uh, survey to frame out a, an appraisal. And it's called the Mindful Leadership Appraisal. Um, it's on my website and my website, you know, I'm sure you guys will share the address uh, for that. Um, and what happens is when you fill this in, you get a feel for the areas that you're strong in, maybe areas that you could use some growth in. And then what what I've done is tie that into the book. So essentially it becomes your sort of reference points. And when you determine, man, I'd li- really like to work in this area of my leadership skills, then you just go to that chapter in the book and it gives you some frameworks. A lot of what I do in the book is reference, you know, a lot of studies, research. So it's not just my, you know, uh, ideas. It's really framed around a really big body of of science. Um, And that gives people tools and references for them to go to. So that's the idea of the appraisal is just really to do a bit of benchmarking. Um, One tip, though, I'd suggest when I've tackled this and I've worked with other, I, I do executive coaching for some, you know, CEOs. Uh, when I work with them, I encourage them to really focus on their strengths. Sure, you don't want to ignore the areas that you maybe need to grow in, but you can get a lot more leverage from building on the strengths you have. Grant, in your book, you talk about 12 pillars to mindful leadership that make up what you call the affinity principle. What does the affinity principle mean? So what I've done, as I explained, I've looked at the Gallup engagement study. And then I've looked at the Globe CEO study, and I've really melded those two things together. The Gallup study looks at engagement of team, and that's a really good benchmark. But what the CEO study, the Globe CEO study does is look at the attributes of a leader. And I've shown how you can intertwine those things to really map out a, you know, really a paint by numbers approach. And so the 12 pillars that you know, I've defined really are designed to do that, to be those 12 increments that you can look at. And you can think of it like spokes on a wheel. Uh, one way to visualize it is to say, okay, I'm going to give it a one to 10 and one being not great, <laughs> 10 being extraordinary. And on each one, you could sort of map out the spokes and then you can look at it and go, yeah, wow, I'm a little weak in this area. And you could start you know, to focus a little bit on that but also to acknowledge your strengths and build on them as well. Great. So I read through the book and I was really interested in the 12 pillars. Could you go for our listeners? Could you go through each pillar, all 12 of them, just, you know, short and quick, but explain each of the pillars. Okay. Yeah. So there's 12 and I won't do this in any particular order, but you know, the first one would be flow state. 
Uh, flow state's that optimal state when you're absorbed in an experience, when really time disappears and you know you're you're fully engaged. Uh, we try and encourage that for team members, for ourselves as well. Number two is uh, challenge. Uh, innovation has to be encouraged in in companies, and we've got to challenge ourselves. And for leaders, sometimes it's it's ideal it seems to surround yourself with like-minded people but if you are really going to be innovative you really got to have people that challenge you and you need to challenge your people uh, number three is mentor a mentor is someone who inspires and perpetuates the cycle of leadership that's something i think is critical for every leader you know if you think about maxwell's pyramid of leadership there's five levels of leadership you know that ultimate four and five, which is sort of the pinnacle of that leadership pyramid, uh, both involve someone who, you know, is a mentor. Uh, then community, uh, building community across departments, uh, cross-pollination between clubs, between people within the industry. You know, I think community is going to be more important than ever uh, after the experience we're going through it currently. Uh, number five is growth. Uh, a growth mindset is an attitude of prosperity and advancement. You know, there's a fixed mindset and a growth mindset, and you can change your mindset over time. And growth mindset, you know, is one that really is abundant and, and seeks to expand horizons, and I think that's critical. Number six is encouragement. Encouragement focuses on improvement and recognition of effort. So it's, we used to have an award at ACAC, or we still do, they, the company still does, and it's called um, rewarding, like it's rewarding excellent failures. We called it uh, ready fire ready aim ready fire aim not ready aim fire and the goal there was to recognize someone that just they just championed something through and they you know got through all the bureaucracy and all the stuff that we know surrounds us oftentimes to get something done and even if it didn't go well or even if it failed if the motivation was good and the and the intention was good to reward that number seven is vulnerability it's implicitly um, linked to authenticity you know, for me, when a leader's vulnerable, they're really authentic. You know, they're really opening themselves up. But again, opening themselves up to differing opinions. You know, one of the things I've gotten better at over the years is attracting team members that think differently to me, that maybe challenge me, that maybe question me. Whereas, um, you know, it's nice to have people around you say, oh, good job. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You know, everything you, says, it says, you, you say is perfect. Uh, that's that's not what the vulnerable leader does. The vulnerable leader opens themselves up. Um, uh, clarity, uh, communication to me is is so critical today, again, more than ever. Uh, and it's setting consistent ex expectations and um, a cons consistent set of, you know, guidelines or parameters or even just giving people the ability to understand where we're headed and, and map their own course towards that. Number nine is empathy. It's where the mindful leader understands and relates to another person. Um, it's pretty straightforward, but it can be in short supply when we're stressed. You know, a lot of times we're worried about what's going on with us and, you know, maybe not what's going on with our team or other people. Uh, number 10 is tools, equipping your team. And that's a literal and figurative example. You know, just giving your team the, the, the support, the resources that they need. Um, in the engagement study, they showed that even the even if teams are equally equipped physically with the equipment, what you're really providing in terms of support is, is more important. And second to last is loops, and that's constant feedback and measurement, you know, of the things that are important that you want to impact. And the last one's listening. Probably the most effective way to enhance your communication is to listen more. It's easy for us to, you know, talk a lot when maybe we know a lot and we've had a lot of experience, but it's amazing what my teens teach me at times when I actually shut up and listen to them. <laughs> I, agree with you. I agree with you on that one. That one's probably my hardest one because I find that I just want to talk, talk, talk all the time. And you're right. Sometimes you just need yeah. to close it and uh, open your ears. So yeah. I, would, I would love to go through deeper through all 12 pillars, as I'm sure our listeners would, would love to have more information about each pillar, but because of time, I'm going to ask you just to pick one of the pillars and let's just dive deep into one of them. So which one would you like to pick out of the 12? So probably vulnerability, just because I just feel like that's something that's, that's tough for people when they're sitting at the top of a company, you know, to be that. Uh, it's easy for us to hunker down, if you will. 
you know, I think about when I've been in crisis and, and that's happened a few times in my career. I owned a group of clubs over in Australia at one point and um, the books had been cooked literally, you know, and I was in crisis mode from the day that I stepped in. And it was uh, really interesting how when I'm sitting in the office staring at spreadsheets like, you know, with a dip, like a deer in headlights and hunkered down, if you will, how much, you know, the team sort of contracted. And then when I said, hey, there's not a damn thing I can do trying to, you know, massage the numbers in this spreadsheet. I need to just get out there, be with my team, be with the members, and we need to, you know, get the rubber on the road. When I did that, you know, I had to expose myself to them, you know, all, all of the truth of what it, what had transpired, where we were at, what we were facing, the challenges. I had to become very vulnerable. And uh, my wife and I were in the club together and both of us were like just open, opened up and said, look, this is where we're at. This is, you know, where we need to go. And that vulnerability actually engaged the team. You know, they knew we wanted good things for the club. We, they knew we wanted good things for them. The members knew we wanted good things as well. And so uh, that the inspiration that came from that vulnerability, that transparency that we exhibited, really transformed that club. So we turned it around in really record time. You know, we we anticipated that we may not get out of the hole that we were in, and within 18 months, we're in the black. And I know a lot of that was to do with the degree of transparency, even that I had with the landlords. You know, I made myself completely vulnerable with the landlords. You know, I said to them, look, this is where I'm at. This is what I'm capable of doing. If you need to close, shut us out and lock us out and find another tenant, I understand. I'm just being very, you know, vulnerable with them. And that resonated with both those landlords. And both of them stuck with me through those 18 months. And I'm, I think they're glad they did. But, you know, at the end of the day, they took a risk. But they took that risk because I was willing to be vulnerable. I loved, loved, loved that story. It was probably one of my favorite pieces in the in the entire book was the story that you told about you and your wife um, buying into this club. And it, I, I felt it was so emotional because it just seemed like one thing after another went wrong for you. Um, <laughs> it was a perfect storm, Dory. Like I've never <laughs> seen anything like it. The same month that we got in there that we learned that all these members had actually canceled and were still on the books and still paying dues. Yeah. We also learned that the city had changed all the parking requirements and we lost all our parking, all like by our 10 spaces. You know, it was just, it, you couldn't have, you couldn't have written a script for it. And no, it was, no. uh, yeah. I yeah. know. I just was, I just felt, I just felt terrible for you. It was just, again, the story, you were so detailed about it and the emotion was so raw. Um, but what I also loved about the chapter on vulnerability is that you said, when we surround ourselves with like-minded people, there is a certain comfort in that camaraderie. And then you said, if we surround ourselves with people of differing opinions, this can invoke feelings of vulnerability. And it's so Absolutely. true when you're around people that, again, yeah, are, are everybody's on the same page. It's easy. So let's just go back one more time to the 12 pillars. I know you went in depth about vulnerability. Is Would you say that was your favorite chapter or is there another one out of the 12 or should I say the 11 that are left that was your favorite to write on? Or maybe maybe it's the other way. Maybe it was the most difficult for you to, to write on. Yeah, you know, that's a really great question. I, I think in every one of these, I recognized in myself where I hadn't done a good job with it at some point in my career. Uh, where I was still learning. In every case, I was still learning on each of the pillars. I, I didn't feel like I, I had it down pat. But again, I referenced a lot of really good tools and, and resources you know, for people to, to call on. Um, but I really feel like probably community and communication, like listening, were, were two of my favorites. I went on to do a lot of study about the blue zones. And you might be familiar with the blue zones. That's uh, the places in the on the globe where people live the longest, you know, they've got the most centenarians. And um, what's interesting about the blue zones, there's, there's some common threads and I was researching the common threads and community was one of the key common threads in all these blue zones where they had really, really strong community. And what they've shown is longevity is, and can be directly related to the community that we build around ourselves. And I look at that in the context of the fitness industry as, you know, the industry we're in, that's a community, you know, the network we're in, maybe locally, um, the club, there's a community, 
there's community within teams, you know, community just threads through everything. And I, and I love that chapter because I feel like building community is a really, really powerful thing. And I've done that in all the clubs that I've ever managed or owned or I've tried to is, is to really build strong community. So I love that. That was one of the ones that I really enjoyed writing about. I felt I'd done a good job in most cases of doing that. Um, probably the one where I feel like I was the weakest um, was probably listening, you know, and it's been my guide over the last few years to be more and more present with people, to listen more, talk less, um, to avoid distractions. And we said in the you know teaser for this show about, you know, auditing your level of distractedness and, you know, your, your level of focus when you're with people. And if you did that in the last week, you know, if listeners did that, I think we'll see that there's a lot of times when we're just not really present. And what I know and what I've learned is when I really sit with my teens or my wife or one of my clients or whoever I'm, I'm with, if I'm really with them and I mean present, I tend to listen more, you know, and I tend to gain more from the exchange. Um, you know, it's hard when we are on a phone call, you can only pick up so much. On a video call, you can pick up more. But when you're in present with somebody truly physically in an analog sense, you know, sitting opposite them, my goodness, you know, it's amazing what you can glean from that. And the more you listen, the more you get out of it, honestly. I, you know, I've been the CEO and COO of some large companies and it's easy to, you know, sort of think, you know, best or that, you know, you've got all the answers, but, you know, I've, I've certainly learned that, you know, listening is, is one of the most powerful things I need to learn and continue to, you know, focus on, but there's huge dividends that come with it. Get your pen ready now for Keep Me's Fit Bizpiration. Okay, what are your three tips for developing the affinity principle in business? Okay, so uh, I think my first and, and I think foremost tip is focus on team. The formula that I described before, you know, great leadership leads to a great team experience, which leads to a great member experience, which equals financial results. And as a leader, you know, if you're focusing on your team, if you really are putting your energy into them, you're, fo- you're, you're resonating with them, empathizing with them, connecting with them, and truly inspiring them. If you're doing those things, the money will come because they'll be representing you in the most positive possible way. Number two would be communication. You know, communicate really well with your team, your members, your community. You know, that includes listening, like we talked about, uh, accepting alternate views, empathizing, being vulnerable. All those things are all part of the communication stream. Um, I think communicating today is so critical. The clubs that I see are really well, you know, well positioned in their communication platform with their members and their members feel really well informed are the clubs that are getting back to normal more quickly. The ones that have been silent or all but silent are the ones that are really struggling to re-engage members. So I don't think, yes, you can over-communicate, but in these times, I think it would be hard to over-communicate and tell people what's going on. And it's a daily thing, you know, it's literally changing day by day. And empathize. Uh, it's really easy to get caught up in our own drama. It's it's really easy for us to, you know, almost be closed off, if you will, to what's going on in other people's lives. What I find is when you open yourself up to what is going on in their lives, that, that those people come closer to you and you get maybe some of the empathy you need back, you know, because we're all struggling right now. It's a, it's a strange world we live in and it's incredibly challenging. And, and, the more empathy that we give, the honestly, the more empathy we'll receive. And and that shouldn't be for that reason, but it's a byproduct of it. So uh, those would be my three. Focus on your team, communicate really well, and empathize. Keep me. Smarter member retention. Keepme.ai. Now let's get back to the show. I highly recommend our listeners go out there and and buy or download Grant's book. Grant, could you tell us about where we can find the Affinity Principle? Uh, Sure. It was just released on Amazon. Uh, So it's available in paperback. It's a black and white version in paperback. There's a color Kindle version. I'm in the process of recording an audio book, but it's it's on Amazon. And, you know, I think 
anybody that buys it, a lot of people that have bought it have said it's sort of encyclopedic. It's more like a textbook. It doesn't read like a textbook. I think it's an easy read, but I do feel like people use it as a resource manual. And that's great, you know, to have a tool like that. So would love it if anybody, you know, wants to pick it up. I hope you'll enjoy it. We we actually achieved bestseller status in five categories on Amazon with the release of it. So uh, I, I'm guessing that there's a few people out there that are enjoying it anyway. Well, I certainly did enjoy it. I had the ebook and the colors and uh, I agree. It was an easy read, um, straight to the point. And I think it's something our listeners could pick up and, and, and get through quickly, but learn a lot of, of important information. Thank you. Well, thank you again for being on our show. Um, it was just a great topic. I wish you the best with your book. And um, I hope listeners out there, make sure you check out The Affinity Principle and then shoot us a, a message. Let us know what you thought of it and we can uh, pass that information along to Grant. And Grant, I will in the show notes also have your contact information as well as a link to your book so it makes it easy for our listeners to get to. Thanks, Dory. Thank you. All right. Have a great day. You too. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Quick Fire Five. The Quick Fire Five questions are with next week's guest, Andrea Isabel Lucas from Bar and Soul Studios. Welcome, Andrea Isabel Lucas, to the Fitness Business Podcast. It's so great to have you. Thanks for having me. You are the owner and CEO of an amazing studio called Bar and Soul, right? Right. Yes. All right. So we're going to do your quick fire five questions today. They're always fun. And these are leading up for your episode that's coming on next week. So the first one, Andrea, is who inspires you in your life and why? My mentor, Esther Fairfax, her mother was Lottie Burke, who invented bar. Esther is 86 and she is still teaching her mother's method out of her home studio in England uh, to this day. Oh, so shout out to Esther. <laughs> Number two, why do you do what you do? Um, to create a culture that empowers women and anyone who is uh, denied their full integrity and uh, potential. Okay. And my favorite question, if you weren't doing what you are doing, what would you be doing? Uh, what comes up for me is I would be a drag queen, which doesn't make any sense because <laughs> I would uh, be a female to female drag queen, but <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> okay. So I got to ask, who would you be in the drag queen world? Oh, well, actually I did used to belong to a circus and burlesque troupe and my stage name was Lulu, Lulu Lemons. <laughs> That is one of our greatest answers. I love it. So much fun. All righty. What is one book other than your own, okay, or podcast, blog, or Facebook group that you would recommend and why? I think that Traction uh, by Gino Wickman is one of the most influential business books I've ever read. And our final question, what will be an action item the FBP family will take away from your main interview next week? Start asking your clients the right questions. Perfect. Well, hey, everybody, tune in next week as we talk to Andrea Isabel Lucas from Bar and Soul, which is a five-location studio up in the New England area of the United States. See you next week. Hi, everyone. Chantal here. Thank you for joining me for this week's throwback episode. That part of the show when we take a little trip down memory lane as I share some of my all-time favorite episodes from the first five years of the show. Now, given so many of us are starting to produce online content these days, I thought that this was a pretty fitting episode for this week. The show was called How to Start Your Own YouTube Channel. My special guest is Sean Cannell. He's a YouTuber, an international speaker, and a business coach. Now, in this episode, we did a step-by-step he talks about how to set up your own YouTube channel, uh, when loading a video, what you should include in the description and the tags, power questions that you should ask when thinking about creating your videos for your channels and how to optimize your YouTube videos. It was a super episode. So if you missed it, if you haven't heard it before, then make sure you hit that rewind button and check it out. All you need to do is listen by going directly to the show notes 
or go to fitnessbusinesspodcast.com and search for episode number 178. Happy listening. Thank you for joining me for this week's show and a reminder that all resources and links for today's episode can be found at fbp.com. And a warm thank you to our founded partner, Active Management. Hi, FBP family. It's JT from Active Management, the founding partner of the Fitness Business Podcast. Thanks to the amazing technology at our fingertips, we can now work with clients all over the world. But right now, you can join the free online Active Management Facebook community. It's an amazing group of people just like you. Sure, I share weekly resources, but it's the power of the community that you will experience that will make this your go-to Facebook group. Remember, it's free, fun, and inspirational. Go to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Active Management Community. What you leave behind is not what's engraved in stone monuments, but what was woven into the lives of others.